Hello. I wanted to start by bringing you to Virginia, where last year a psychologist by the name of Timothy Wilson decided to do something terribly, terribly cruel to a group of people. These were students. These were also people who lived in the area, people who happened to travel there, and he caught them in a mall. And this is the very cruel thing he did. He forced them to sit in a room, having surrendered their cell phones and any other device, in a chair by themselves for 10 minutes, with nothing else there. And then he asked them how they did. How how was this? That was the entire study. Just sitting by yourself without a cell phone. People were miserable. They hated him. They said this was the absolute worst experiment they had ever participated in. He got worse ratings in his many decades as a psychologist than he'd ever gotten in the past. So then he decided to switch things up a bit. He said, "Okay, I'm going to change the parameters of the study. Now you have an option. You can sit here doing nothing." Or you can administer electric shocks to yourself. <laughs> Lo and behold, over half the people started shocking themselves. <laughs> One guy went so far as to shock himself 190 times within the scope of the study. And there were some gender differences. Men, for instance, over two thirds of the men shocked themselves. Women were a little less likely to shock themselves. Fewer than half did. But overall, people preferred the electric shocks to doing nothing. That's how painful the experience of nothing, the experience of boredom, actually was. So today, you guys are at a conference about big data, about lots of information. What happens when there's lots of stuff going on around you? What I want to talk about is nothingness, boredom, what you do. When you're actually forced to sit by yourself and do nothing, and think about it for a second, when was the last time you actually did that? When was the last time that you actually spent 10 minutes alone with your thoughts, when it wasn't you trying to fall asleep or you in the shower? We really don't do that anymore. We've lost the knack for it, and that might be a very big problem in terms of how we think. One of the great philosophers of the 20th century, Bertrand Russell, explored boredom in his book *The Conquest of Happiness*, and he tells us that a generation that cannot endure boredom will be a generation of small men, a generation in whom every creative impulse slowly withers, as if they were cut flowers in a vase. It's not a very good image, but it has a lot of truth. And Today, I want to tell you about why we need to pursue boredom, why we need to recapture boredom, why we need to include boredom as a good word, not a bad word, as an everyday part of our lives. So, about 50 years after Bertrand Russell died, Jonathan Schooler, another psychologist, decided to study the question of attention, and in his studies, he discovered something really interesting. Something that happens when we stop doing anything and do well nothing. And what happens then is this sort of creative rejuvenation, the opposite of cut flowers in a vase, that you don't see at other times. People start thinking about the future. They start planning. They start activating parts of the brain. That tells them, hey, these are possible future scenarios. They start building things. They start creating things in their mind. They start cross-pollinating. Ideas that seemed completely unrelated suddenly come together. So, for instance, if I said crab, pine, and sauce, and you were just sitting doing nothing, you'd be much more likely to say apple. That's what brings them all together. Than you would if you were actually sitting there with all this data, everything coming at, at you at the exact same time. That, by the way, is the remote associates test, which Schooler uses quite frequently, and which I was unable to solve the first time I ever heard it, unfortunately.
So Schooler discovered that what happens when we're doing nothing is this default mode network of the brain becomes incredibly active. And that's the part of our brain that activates when we're doing nothing at all. That's the part of our brain that becomes inactive when we're actually multitasking, when we're busy doing different things. And that's the part of our brain that leads to creative insight. So all of those apocryphal stories that you hear about you know, Poincaré stepping onto a bus, revolutionizing mathematics, those stories are apocryphal, yes, but they're also true in the sense that that's when insight happens, when we give ourselves time to be bored, time to do nothing. A few years ago, psychologists did another really cruel thing. For four days, they took a group of people who had no idea this would be done to them for a nature hike and made them once again surrender all their electronic devices. When they came back, they found that they were over 50%, I hate saying smarter, but better at every single thing that they had done before. They were better at paying attention. They were better at solving problems. They were better at creative insight. They were better at their jobs. They actually were able to function much more effectively, much more efficiently after this four-day hiatus. And they didn't hate it. They actually thought this was pretty cool. Most of us don't have time to go on a four-day nature hike, unfortunately. But, although I, I recommend we do it, New York is beautiful for a nature hike. Although we've learned that even 30 minutes of something like that can help. One study that had people solve impossible problems found that they, grew, that they gave up much more quickly if they just got the problems than if they took 30 minutes to take a walk. And if you didn't have time to take a walk, they found that screensavers of nature actually had the exact same effect. So you became better if you suddenly put screensavers of nature on your computer and then solved the problems. And all this really does is force you, instead of tackling information right away, to take a step back, to give yourself mind space, which is what boredom provides. Now, my first book was about Sherlock Holmes, and I always used to make the joke that Sherlock Holmes is actually the most inactive, active detective in the world. Because if you read the stories, what he does more than anything is sit in his chair and do nothing. You know, he has this fingers crossed illustration of Holmes that I'm sure lots of you have seen. And there's one story in particular that I think captures what I'm trying to get at, and it's called The Adventure of the Red-Headed League. In that story, Sherlock Holmes meets a young man who has flaming red hair. He comes to Holmes and Watson and says, you know, Mr. Holmes, I think there's something wrong. I've been hired by this agency just for the color of my hair, and I get paid a lot of money to sit in a room and basically do nothing all day. And I think this is a little strange. Don't you think this is a little strange? And... What they, what they do then is Watson says, ooh, this is so exciting. Holmes, shall we go and investigate? And the red-headed man says, Holmes, shall we go and investigate? Um, and Holmes says, no, no, I'll call you if I need you. Please go away. So the man leaves. Watson's still brimming with excitement. He says, oh, I have so many ideas. Let's do this. Let's do that. And Holmes says, Watson, calm yourself. This is a three-pipe problem. He sits in his chair. And what does he do? He smokes three pipes. At the end of the three pipes, he has the solution to the red-headed league, which I'm not going to give you today. I encourage you to read the story. And what we have here is the difference between productive boredom, the three-pipe problem, what he would have done in Wilson's room would be sit there, Watson would have been the guy shocking himself 190 times because he doesn't realize that you can just sit quietly. And it's actually not Watson's fault because we are not trained to do that. And if we're not trained to do that, we lose the ability to do it. It's like a muscle that's going to either become honed, become built with time and effort, or atrophy so that you feel the need for electric shocks because you're just so scared of being alone for your, um, with your thoughts. And a few years ago, people actually decided to test this. They said, hey, you know, we live in this world 
where we have constant stimulation, where everyone's always connected, where you have 50 million tabs open at once, where you're live tweeting, posting to Facebook, checking this, checking that. No one's really ever doing one thing anymore. We're always multitasking. And as most of us know by this point, our brains can't actually multitask. So when we think we're multitasking, we're very rapidly switching between tasks, going from one task to another. And this is really cognitively taxing. It's really demanding. It's not good for us. But they thought, hey, maybe multitasking does some good stuff too. Maybe we can become better at task switching. So here's what they did. First, they divided people into heavy and light media multitaskers. So the people who right now have their phones out or their computers out, you're probably heavy multitaskers. The people who are doing nothing and who usually just focus on what you're doing, you're probably lighter media multitaskers. They had them do a few tasks which focused on two things. One, how well do you filter out distractions? So they had to pay attention to red rectangles, ignore the blue rectangles. And then they also looked at what happens when you switch tasks. You had the rectangle task, and then you had another task with numbers and letters, and you had to switch between them rapidly. The heavy multitaskers were much worse at filtering out distractions. And that makes a lot of sense, right? If you're always doing lots of things, you have to keep all the inputs open. You can't actually say, no, no, I'm going to ignore this. But at the thing that they were supposed to be good at, which is switching between tasks, they were also worse. Their reaction time was much slower, and it took them longer to focus their concentration on another task, to switch from one to the other. So they became worse at the very thing they were supposed to be good at. So that's what happens when we don't know how to sit alone. We lose the ability to concentrate, and we become even worse at the thing we're supposed to be good at. And this is what happens when we have information constantly coming at us, and we forget to take a step back. We forget that we should actually just clear our heads, clear our minds, and learn to be alone. So I want to do something that you probably haven't done, especially if you came here early, which is have you all close your eyes. And I want you to focus on nothing but your breath just the ins and outs of your breath. And if you find yourself being distracted, say, hey, distracting thought, I acknowledge you. Now please go away. All right, you can open your eyes. That was precisely 20 seconds. It probably felt like a little bit longer to some of you just because it's a really bizarre thing for me to have asked you to do. And it was probably pretty damn difficult. It's, I know it's very hard for me to do that for even a few minutes. But what you just did is a very easy version of mindfulness meditation. I hate the term because right away you think Buddhism, you think New World, you think I don't have time for this. But what you may not know is that, first of all, you can do this absolutely anywhere, in, wherever, in whatever you are sitting, like you just did. And some of the top hedge fund managers in the world swear by this and actually do this every single day. Ditto some of the top business owners, CEOs. I won't name names, but a lot of them actually go for mindfulness training. Because what happens after you do this for as little as 10 minutes a day is you start building up that muscle, that ability to pay attention, that ability to embrace and actually make boredom productive so that afterwards you do become more creative and insightful. You are able to ask big questions, to see the big picture. You're not inundated by the flow of data, but you actually learn how to manage it. And we all have this ability innately. Think about little children. I mean, think about how curious kids are. Think about how imaginative their play is. Think about what happens when you leave them alone. They can make a toy out of absolutely anything. You know, suddenly the ladle becomes a sword and they're wearing the colander on their head and it's a crown and they have all these made-up games. 
when you're walking down the street with them, they're like a little puppy. They can't go past a single blade of grass. You can't go past a block because everything they want to stop, sniff, explore, ask you, what is this? Why is this? And sometimes they ask the most profound questions and you say, huh, how in the world did you actually think of this? And Bertrand Russell calls this fruitful monotony. So when you're not forced to distraction, when you're not actually, ha when you're not having different things impinging on your attention, you become like a little child. And even with kids today, we don't let them do that. As soon as they say, I'm bored, I don't want to do this, we thrust them in front of a TV, we give them an iPad, we give them an iPhone. And the more we do that, the less able to pay attention we are. So that by the time we're us, we're all grown up, we look at kids and we say, oh my God, stop wasting my time. I don't know why the sky is blue and I don't particularly care. And so what boredom does, the reason why I think we need to recapture boredom is to recapture that ability to really see the world, to really pay attention. And we shouldn't be afraid of it. I think at the end of the day, boredom really scares us. A lot of us really don't want to be alone with our thoughts. We think, oh God, I don't know what's in there. I don't really want to pay attention to it. Even today, I purposefully decided not to use slides because that way you just pay attention to me. There's nothing competing for your attention. When I tell people that I often give talks without slides, they say, oh my God, isn't that scary? How do you know what you're going to say? You have quotes in your talks. Do you actually memorize them? I say, well, yes, I do. And no, it's, you know, after a while, it's not scary. It's a way that you can engage more. It's a way that people can actually pay attention to the material. And it shouldn't be scary, but it is, because in boredom, there's uncertainty. And in creativity, there's uncertainty. And uncertainty is something that deeply frightens us if we're not used to dealing with it. But where I'd like to end today is with a quote from Joseph Brodsky, one of my favorite writers. And I stole the title of this talk, In Praise of Boredom, from him. And once upon a time, he gave a commencement address to Dartmouth University called In Praise of Boredom. And he said, when you're hit by boredom, let yourself be crushed by it. Drown, submerge. Because what happens at the end of it is the type of creativity that you can't otherwise summon. It's the way that you can actually look at big data and ask the big questions. And it's the groundwork within which we can get the big answers. Thank you very much.